be 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern time. So for those that are on, on time, we don't want to uh, keep you waiting. So I appreciate your time today and uh, very excited to be on with two uh, very experienced um, uh, security professionals uh, on talking about how digital twins and, and 3D visualization in general can aid implementation of standards. And we're going to be addressing healthcare in general and uh, the new standard uh, security design and security management standards from IAHSS. And we will be talking about some case studies in particular uh, with a consultant, uh, Ben Butchko, who's on the line here, um, um, who had performed a recent uh, security design project um, on a hospital in the Nevada area. So we'll, we'll get into that in the, pro in, in the presentation. So a, a brief introduction to myself. My name is Kelly Watt. I'm the CEO of a company called Visual Plan. Uh, we're a software company that sells support um, the implementation and adoption of di digital twins, primarily with 360 imagery, but also bringing in CAD, BIM, and all this kind of fun things. And really we focus on making visualization operational. Um, Steven, you wanna introduce yourself and give us a little background on your background? Thanks, Kelly. My name is Steve Nibelink. I lead the healthcare team here at M3T. We're a Pennsylvania based company, a regional company. And we're gonna spend some time today talking as Kelly just said about not only the IHSS standards, uh, but a case study that Ben did as well as visualization through the digital twin services. Great, and, and I did drag Ben on this call last moment. Thank you very much for making the time, Ben. Uh, do you wanna introduce yourself uh, and, and then we'll uh, get started? Uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, this is Ben Butchko and I uh, started uh, Butchko Inc. We are now combined uh, uh, and now operating as Butchko ESI. Uh, we've, we've provided security, consulting, design, services at the uh, individual from the individual clinic level to enterprise across healthcare across industrial environments um, a, a, a host of them and actually it's it's quite nice that uh, my history with with uh, the with mr nibblink goes back 20 plus years through several uh, several uh, different organizations, uh, but really focused on some high-end solutions and uh, have, have the utmost respect for Steve and, and have worked with Kelly for a number of years as well. So uh, it's kind of a small circle here when we, we get into the specialization, isn't it? And see the sim similar faces anyways, which is really great. Um, so I'm going to make a bold statement. I think we can all agree on uh, and, and that statement is that, you know, in specifically around healthcare facilities, that facility operations teams and security managers are really struggling to maintain operational knowledge, knowledge about their facilities, their assets, their processes, and all that goes into be able to protect people, property, IP, et cetera, um, and to look at emergency management procedure, but all of this kind of things, and also from an asset op operational perspective and maintenance, and in fact, we're dealing with all this workforce turnover as well. So these, these are challenges we're dealing with and we have new technology being injected and there's just ongoing change all the time. COVID has exasperated that and access to these facilities is really difficult. I can't just go walk into an operating room whenever I like to, to gather information. So it's a really unique industry in that respect. So I'm going to turn it over to Steve to talk a little bit right now about the IHSS Healthcare Security and Design Guidelines and updates here, and then we'll uh, dive back into the digital twin conversation. Thanks, Kelly. So IHSS, the International Association for Healthcare Security and Safety, is an organization solely dedicated to security and safety professionals in the healthcare space. And that healthcare space could be senior care, acute care, or any one of the varieties that kind of fall under that umbrella. They've got two sets of guidelines that they publish, and they're, they're created and maintained and updated by healthcare security and safety professionals, as well as professionals from OSHA and consulting organizations and so on. The first are the security industry guidelines. And these guidelines are now in the 13th edition. There are 77 individual guidelines, three currently in review, soon to be published. And these guidelines are there to help the security and safety professional, the healthcare organization, create policy and procedure, best practices, the, the real fundamentals of what they need to do to make sure they're doing their job in supporting the, you know, the caring mission of the healthcare organization. The other, the other side of that are the design guidelines, and they're in the third edition. 
And these design, gu design guidelines are very important because it really addresses how we're going to structure not only security and safety, but into the, the full design of the facility. How we're using, whether you say SEPTED, you know, um, crime prevention through, in, through environmental design, the best way to design a building, to structure the, in, the interior, the exterior, and how security and safety play in a part of that design. So those, that guideline book is actually referenced in the FGI uh, uh, book, which is the Facility Guidelines Institute, a real, uh, a real valuable piece of information that architects and engineers use when they're talking about how to do a build out or renovation or new construction in the healthcare space. So all these tools are available and they really become vital as to what we're talking about today in terms of Ben's case study uh, from his healthcare facility in Nevada to the visualization work that Kelly does with Digital Twin, because this is how it all fits together to make sure that we're using all the tools and we're collaborating. We're not just in silos, but we're collaborating to make the best decisions possible. Safety and security, but ultimately for the patient care. Yeah, and, and Thanks, that's Kelly. a really good point, you know, Stephen. I think that what happens in, in architectural design and construction, security is kind of left at the curb at times. And, you know, be able to bring security in at the earlier stages so that uh, the oversight through the process can be implemented. And, and, you know, that's really important so we don't have to redo things later or rework things later. So I think visualization provides a really a good opportunity to have that type of oversight. So uh, just a thought on that, uh, gentlemen. One is, you know, the first, the first document really is from us that we use as a governance. And that governance is where the discussions start cross boundaries that, that's really the key so that security, it, the details may not come till later, but the concept and the importance and that understanding comes in early. So that's where we've used that, uh, that process and that reference. And then the, then the design standards are, they also are, are the, that follow on for setting some higher level expectations that as Steve mentioned, that your architects and your designers and design engineers, consultants alike will work with and further expand upon. So each one, it, it has its role in adapting as you get more granular in that operation. And, and that's irrespective of, the, uh, of a digital twin approach, but digital twin approach comes in as a communication tool which support the implementation of both of those. So it's like every other tool used well, it's to your advantage. Used poorly, you end up trying to cut the grass with a, a chainsaw. It's doable, but it sure is not the most efficient way to get there. Got it. That's a great point there, Ben. Steve, can you talk to me a little bit about the specific goals in healthcare and how these are competing? And especially with long-term um, care facilities and acute facilities, you know, these are kind of different animals, aren't they? They are. They're remarkably different. Uh, you know, just the patient population, the services that are offered are remarkably different between acute care and senior care. So, for example, when you look at senior care, sometimes just in that design phase, in, in the operational phase, sometimes those goals can be conflicting. You know, we always want to maintain that concept of security and safety because, you know, the immediate customer is, is that resident or patient on site, but it's really the families who have a have a, a large say in what happens to their loved ones and they wanna make sure they're okay. But there's privacy, dignity, there's health, there's an institutional versus a residential side uh, when we talk about senior care. And the designs really need to support the changes in the different levels of care. So if you're at a continuing care retirement community, it's going from independent living to assisted living to further down the, down the stream all the way to memory care or, or complete care. And, and that's where we would look at the, the different technologies, but also again, design and understanding the facility. And as Ben Eck just so wonderfully pointed out, the governance, let's make sure we start at a broad scale and work granular. So when you look at the needs of the residents in senior care, for example, um, you know, what is, what's important? If we're talking about memory care, we certainly wanna talk about some sort of wander management solution. Um, some sort of video surveillance, some integration with automatic doors, some sort of simple communication system. Again, the patients, the residents, the staff, these are all those customers as well as the families. So we want to make sure that we're looking at what's happening in the big picture. And again, as repeating what Ben said, moving to a granular level. The visualization helps us 
understand what's really happening. Uh, you know, prints and paper are great, but sometimes visual learning is easier and it's easier to talk about the design from a visual perspective than just looking at a blueprint. So again, you know, technology and design force multipliers. Um, that's a very common phrase, but you take these because we're there to support not only safety and security, but the mission of the healthcare organization. And, and I think, you know, in the acute care, it's almost interesting because we have a, a variety of different zones where we need to require certain access because of, uh, you know, people in surgery or people that, that are in, in critical conditions. So really having this layer of, uh, of who can get access where really allows it really need, gives us this requirement. We have, a, have to have a very good understanding of things and how everything comes together. You know, what's behind the door, above the ceiling, below the floor, but also what are those zones? How do we, uh, how do we have that flow of people and, and how do we uh, kind of monitor that and protect that as well, right? Kelly, that's 100% correct. You know, if, if you look at the IAHSS annual crime survey, it gives us data points, statistical information to show where those, those areas of service in the hospital create the most challenges. So for example, we know that if you have an emergency department, if you have a behavioral health department, these are two areas where we always seem to have challenges in terms of security and safety. And it's that visualization that helps us understand how we need to protect those particular areas and devise policies and procedures to make sure that the patients and staff are safe. So again, visualization is the key. Let's make sure that, that we're analyzing all the data that's available to us, creating policies and procedures to support the patients and staff. But again, I keep talking about, we have to go back where you know, security and safety is there to support the mission of the healthcare organization. Absolutely. So let, let's, uh, let's define what we mean by this term digital twin because it's a relatively new term to describe a process that's been around for a while. And what, what we are defining it as is a virtual representation of the real world, usually a physical structure, it could be processes, et cetera. But it's more than that because that's just a picture. That's just a carbon copy. What we need to also look at is the management of change. So how do we recapture this information? How do we manage that information over time? So it, it is the historical and the current information that goes into a digital twin and it goes into the collaboration and the discussions and the learning and the outcomes. Um, digital twins are based on a use case and who is using it for what purposes. <clears throat> and that's gonna determine what type of data that we're using, who gets access, <clears throat> and really what the end goals. And this can also, on the operational side, um, you know, look at uh, IoT devices and security uh, technologies and, and how we're operating those on a long-term basis. So, I think a lot of people think digital twin, they think a 3D model, and it's much more than that. That's a digital asset. This is a process and, and digital assets uh, and information uh, all together. And, and we're going to be using this in a generative design process, like what Ben's going to be talking about, so that we can do scenarios before we implement. So the idea is test before implement, uh, validate before invest it in it, and then troubleshoot before we, we have problems on site. And the benefits here are monstrous because we're reducing all these uh, touch points back and forth to facilities and, and reducing any rework and these types of things that traditionally happen on sites. So I'm going to give you a visual understanding of kind of where we are oftentimes as outsiders, as subject matter experts, receiving facility information for the first time, maybe getting a few site photographs some heavily marked up or inaccurate drawings or sometimes scanning physical blueprints. I literally do this all the time. It's really frustrating. And almost never can we trust that information to be accurate and current. It was at one time when we commissioned the building, but it's the day after when things start changing that, that give us this mistrust. So what happens is we have to go to the site, we have to validate in person by seeing. Seeing is believing and validating. But if we had this information in a, in a current format that's three-dimensional from 360 imagery, and we know that it's time stamps that it was created, you know, a couple of weeks or months ago. We have a much higher trust level. We can use and depend on that information, and because it's capturing everything, we're not having those field of view gaps and, and that kind of orientation problem we have with photographs, trying to piece together where things are and how they were lo located. And then when we talk about the information side of this too, when I have these these three ring binders stacked up here, which we all are dealing with processes and you know, uh, these things that are on the shelf, 
you know, what can we take here and make it interactive so I can touch something and get information, you know, from a building information modeling perspective, the I, the information is really critical. So how do we make information more uh, accessible, easier to find? And that also kind of looks into, you know, how do we bring this into operational processes like a CMS or a asset management tool or something like that. So those are things that we do as a company to help bridge the technology gap. So I'm going to um, bring and Kelly, go ahead, Brett, Ben, you got a point there? Yeah, the one thing that I think in the video in your last slide, which, which exemplifies is the fact that when you have areas where you're sensitive to contamination, where there is PPE involved in getting in, the use of visual twin in the healthcare environment can be very powerful in that you can share visual information, details, and talk them through, talk people through in an environment that's more visually rich, uh, has more depth of field, depth of view, without bringing more people in to either increase contamination to an area, increase a safety risk to the area for the folks that are entering in, or for the residents and the equipment and everything else that's there. So it's it's broadening that aspect and allowing for immediate impact. And for example, we may need to have you know, uh, Steve based in Pennsylvania. Well, if we've got a facility that is out of state, but Steve is an expert either medically, uh, safety in security or facility operations that we can coalesce in a virtual arena we can coalesce an ex, a level of expertise quickly and address those crucial problems in a much more cost-effective, time-effective manner with a lot less risk of miscommunication. Yeah, and I, I think Absolutely. that's a great point. It also leads me into that thought of pulling cables and, and removing drop ceilings and, and the, the, the multiplier of concern around that because of dark dust particles and, and whatnot that there's a clean air uh, um, aspect here that we must maintain for acute care centers. So, you know, be able to virtually go up into a roof, walk around, find cables, power remotely, not only saves time and, and site visits and appointments to facilities, but also allows us not to have to cordon off a section of the facility and remove patients. So it, it really is that much more of a problem to do these exercises in a healthcare environment than in an office building that people aren't there at night, isn't it? <laughs> so we brought this, this concept of operating blind up in our last webinar and I wanna resurface this uh, because you know, oftentimes we're doing our job uh, based on speculation, on guesswork, on, on information that we get from people, right? So I'm asking Steve uh, some questions about the facility. I'm asking other questions from Ben and I'm kind of piecing together uh, little pieces of information, but I haven't validated myself. You know, and, and this information can be made available. What we're talking about with a digital twin is knowledge management, putting that information in a place that we can access safely, securely, but that we know it's correct and updated. So, you know, questions to ask are, do all your stakeholders have an intimate knowledge of your facilities, your processes, and your procedures? The answer is probably, well, a few might, and a few might know some things, but I'm guaranteeing nobody knows all of this information inside and out. And when we have an assessment done by someone like Ben or someone from NT3, you know, has everyone in the organization actually read that, uh, that hazard vulnerability assessment? Do they understand the issues? Is everyone on board and acting to implement the countermeasures? And oftentimes when we get reports, we get a 50 page assessment we don't always act on reading through it and understanding it intimately, but when we can explain information visually and step through, through these findings and explain why by showing just human nature, when we see things, we can believe them and comprehend them much better. And that, that's very true when we start to talk about approvals at a CEO level or finance and, and other stakeholders, how your changes affect their departments, right? So there's a lot to go into the planning uh, and, and, and a process here. Um, and I think there's also a really good opportunity for training here um, to be able to remotely have law enforcement first responders virtually walk through uh, the facilities, understand escape routes, all of these kind of aspects, uh, both with existing staff and with outsiders. Actually, a, a wonderful comment I got from uh, Katie, uh, who works at uh, Paladin Security and, and is actually on the, the one of the subject matter experts on the um, 
IAH as a standard is she says that when we come into work, we commonly follow a certain path. You know, we go, go from our car and we go to where we typically work, we hang our jacket, and that's the path, that's the route that we're familiar with. But during an, an emergency, we may act to go through that same route. It may not be the safest or the best path, but we may choose to do that because that's what's imprinted on our memory. So there's a lot there. And then from a physical building uh, perspective, what are the current conditions, right? Uh, where are my critical assets? What are my critical assets? What are the priorities? How do we uh, look to protect and maintain those assets? What is the access level to information? Who has access and, and when they have access? What hazards should I be concerned with? And you know, all this respond come or all of this information comes down to having a prepared response. Now, I love this term. Good, just Google it. As we're sitting around the Thanksgiving tur the turkey dinner, and people have their opinions, and they say. Uh, what those are. What do we typically do today? We say, well, I'm going I'm to find out for sure. I'm going to validate. I'm going to go to Google and I'll find out that information. And I'll know based on the, the information is available. And it's very similar to digital twins. You can search and find and validate that information anytime you want rather than speculate. Out. The other key aspects of digital twins is that you do have 24, 7, 365 access access to facilities where it's very difficult to get access, as we mentioned, both in acute care and long-term care. And that if we are reducing these site visits, everyone can benefit. Every service provider, security professional, outside first responders, it's not only a time saver, cost saver, but it's also a, a, a health uh, risk that we reduce having people on site and a security risk. So I wanna get into this discussion about speaking the same language because we have many different stakeholders involved with security design, the security management, the security planning. And I'm gonna just kind of sketch out some of those people. So on the facility side, we have facility operators, health and safety, security directors that are really in involved with the operations, the compliance, the regulations and response to um, you know, techs and to other people and also the ones that are receiving complaints and issues that come in. The techs are responsible for implementation, repair, maintenance of technology, but they really depend on a lot of information from different people to be able to do their job efficiently. Um, we have on the other side, the CEOs, the CFOs, and the owners that are responsible to budget, plan, approve, and without their comprehension, without their detailed understanding of what they're doing and why they're doing and why they're approving it, how can they do their job and approve things and make sure that money is put into the right place to best uh, operate the building and also protect the people and the, and the assets within it. And then we have our patients, our visitors, staff and guards. They're the first line of defense that, that is going to be out there and seeing issues, maybe reporting things, anything from a, a building being you know, too hot or too cold to actually suspecting that there are issues or, or monitoring that, that surveillance. And, and they really need to have a really good understanding of the processes and the procedures and be able to implement those and enforce those. Um, and also they are oftentimes the ones that are training and onboarding new people. So all of that requires a lot of information and, and, and be able to communicate effectively. And then we have the outsiders to this uh, conversation, the first responders, police and fire, some of the federal agencies that don't really get the opportunity to walk the halls and intimately know where things are. And, and more so than a floor plan that's flat and really a box, but with all the furniture and the context and, and the technologies were within that building to have a rich understanding that we typically get from a site walkthrough, right? That's why law enforcement typically do a lot of on-site field training because it's the muscle memory and the practice that allows them to be efficient and respond and react effectively uh, during an incident and instead of, of kind of learning as we go. So, so these, I think what happens is a lot of the times we have these stakeholders communicating back and forth. Sometimes they're not uh, getting the information firsthand, a lot of emails, voicemails, and, and a lot of the communication breaks down. And this is where we have problems in projects and understandings and data silos, and also with this understanding how we implement, um, you know, countermeasures and technology. And all of this does lead to rework and, and, and mistakes and, and gaps. So based on kind of this thought, Steve, uh, Ben, do you want to make some comments on kind of what your feedback is on, on what this looks like from uh, a communication perspective and how visualization can help? Yeah, yes, exactly. 
the communication inside, um, especially on the planning side, is is a real challenge sometimes because if people are coming from different stakeholders or silos within an organization, and this you know the visualization side helps people all recognize the same data point or the same data set. It helps us to start from a common ground. So that communication is key. So so we're all building together instead of maybe some misinterpretation or assumptions that may not be accurate. So the communication side, you know, I'll go back to Ben's, Ben's word before granular. Let's get granular so we understand how we're gonna build this. And again, that's common definitions. And again, the visualization drives that common ground. Absolutely. Ben, do you got some feedback on that? Or would, do you wanna kind of drive into this concept of, you know, what stages can we use visualization from, from your perspective? Um, uh, uh, doing your assessments and design and implementation of, uh, of, of your project work. I, I was, was really waiting to chime in until we had this slide because it is, is truly a blend from the last, the last one as well as this one. And as, as Steve mentioned, you're getting everyone on the same point of reference. That progresses from a greenfield project where you're starting just from a you know a, a blank uh, a blank lot and then you've got some design drawings how do you progress that into a 3d imagery and then how that continues to grow over time uh, to your uh, upgrades to your um, operations and so i think what you have and and what we've done in the planning phase where we're assessing a situation uh, an actual facility, a planned facility, and we're coming up with utilizing the IAHSS tools for what really is, we're taking the governance and the governance really describes how we're going to address all of the aspects within this slide. When you get into the design guidelines, you're actually moving from that governance into the interpretation in the planning phase of that management process into the design of the equipment, the design of the procedures, the personnel process, all of those have to blend. And, and that's really where a lot of times, because, because people assimilate, especially in your operations uh, aspect, they assimilate and utilize information differently. As, as an engineer, you know, twice over, I didn't get it right the first time, so they sent me back for a deck second degree. I'm used to looking at design drawings. Um, Steve, we've worked together on, on designs and implementations over the years to where we know we, we have the ability to, because of re sheer repetition, to replicate in, a, in an imagined world what we see on paper. But when you're, when you're dealing with folks that are living in operations and their, their frame of mind is working with people and, and providing a service to help they either help the, uh, the folks that are working in facilities to help the visitors or the patients in those facilities. They don't think in terms of those 2D versions very much. So having that visualization and Steve's laughing and uh, smiling because we, we've lived that um, and not just in healthcare, but um, where we can show that same information in a blend and we can take here is the, here's what the facility looks like today. And we're gonna overlay the design visualization in a 3D manner inside that same visual rich manner. So here's where the card reader is gonna go. Here's where the camera is gonna go. Here's where the revolving doors or the turnstiles or the, the delayed egress door, or we're going to have the, the baby monitoring system. And, and ben, These I are think the zones. just to cut in for a second, like that leads to the discussion about the how and the why we do things and the gaps, right? So when right. we can all get on the same page and discuss, you may have a design concept and then hear from an operator why they want to do something different or why it may not work or why it competes with another business unit's objectives. So. I think that critical thinking that goes into the generative design process and that sharing of information, bringing everyone into that process, that what get us, gets us better results, doesn't it? That's, that's really the key to touch the stakeholders in a means of communication that's important to those stakeholders. 
and then utilizing that information all the way through and in the last slide you know, went from design into implementation so that now when you go to your installation team they say well i expected it to look like this but it doesn't because they looked at it on paper you know they they expected the wall to be blue well it was it's just it was midnight blue not baby blue and and that totally changes how the cameras work how the lighting has to be assimilated uh, and and all these other issues so it runs through there all the way through emergency emergency planning and yeah. an operation. So yeah, this, I'll, I'll jump onto an example. One, one quick point before you get started there, Ben, because I know you've got a, a lot of great points to talk about here. I had an experience with a healthcare facility about three years ago, uh, working with ADT. And, and it was, uh, it was, it was really interesting because the, the technician that was explaining the implementation to the owner was sitting down and, and showing them why they couldn't put cameras up on the side of the building. And, and because the trees were there, but you know, the, the leaves were there, right? He's like, well, you're not gonna see a damn thing, right? And it was really simple to say, okay, well, let's cut them down. And that decision was made quickly because the owner was involved and can make those decisions based on how and why. Another aspect on that same project is we're looking at a 2D floor plan and a camera was placed on this one part of the building and the owner is saying, well, there's no way that's gonna work. That's part of the warehouse about 30 foot high. So these kind of discussions that grow from 3D visualization can really get us more accurate understandings and better decisions. But uh, let's talk a little bit about this project and what you learned on, and how, how the visualization helped. Sure. Um, I think the, the real piece is, it's great to talk about ideas. It's like, oh, wow, this rich 3D visual plan is so cool. I can get so excited. My kids are gonna love it. It's gonna be like a video game or my designers are gonna like it. And, I, and I'm gonna be able to present this to the CEO and to the marketing folks and, and to the first responders and everyone's gonna love it. And then the other shoe drops and it goes, oh, well, this is gonna cost me $8 million on a $2 million hospital upgrade. So kind of a bummer. Well. The benefit here and the nice thing is that's not the case. And, and we actually did this project that I'll describe here was, uh, it was in the middle of summer, right at the heart of, at the, the height of COVID at a level one trauma center, major, ho uh, major hospital. And we had, and, and we actually proposed this project before becoming intimate with visual plan tool. So we proposed the project uh, to design up what became a 700 plus camera, uh, complete redesign and extension of, uh, expansion of what was existing in this multi-building hospital complex uh, with the, the main hospital uh, being uh, just under a million square feet. Uh, we were able to fit in by, instead of having five trips out to the facility, uh, because of COVID restrict constraints and the time and everything. Uh, we did one trip working and doing the assessment, dealing with meeting with stakeholders all the way through two people. At the same time, we are walking through the facility to orient uh, we, and, and getting in and out of PPE and the like. We are capturing these vis this visual, visual Im imagery. We did three in, in three, albeit long days, we did three days worth of capture and discussions. That became the only trip to site that we needed to design, to design and move this through into, uh, into the procurement process and into the deployment process in this hospital complex. We had to get a little creative, uh, certainly because of, uh, of HIPAA re re restrictions and, and privacy and the like. Uh, so when we went into the trauma center, it was during the week and we went in at 2.30 a.m. when it was the, the least busy uh, in that time, of that, that time of the week. So we were able to capture everything we needed and be able to reference back and forth in discussion with hospital staff in the safety and security staff, as well as facility management and the IT staff. Uh, and as to this is what we're working to achieve, this is why. We've identified that, oh, well, we, this is the perfect place for the camera, except for the exit sign that's in the way. 
or except for the wayfinding sign that's in the way uh, or, or other issues that, that we certainly found. And so in that time frame where we had budgeted three eight hour days to nine hour days on site, we ended up doing three 12 hour days on site and within the cost that we originally budgeted for the project uh, for travel that we didn't have to do, we covered our extra time on site. We covered all the equipment, everything we needed um, and the software for the visual plan. And it also allowed us to be more efficient in the design process so that we didn't have to go back and design something and get feedback because when we had questions, we contacted and through a virtual meeting like this, we walked through that area collectively with a, uh, with a URL link that we could send in advance, walk it through, resolve the issue. Everybody else, it was much more efficient. We came in cost neutral and, uh, and a lot less impact. It was cost neutral for us, but it was a cost savings for the hospital because they didn't have to worry about these foreign intruders uh, being the security design team moving in and out of ev literally every place in that in that hospital from the operating theater to the emergency department to the trauma center uh, you name it we we touched it and it was very and really, exciting and, and that's at the beginning stage here we're talking about a, a, a design project not a total building design it's just a, a technology design <clears throat> but now having that digital twin for operational purposes move, moving forward, I mean, it's already paid off and it's gonna repay itself off multiple times if it was implemented operationally in the future, right? So I think when we think about digital twins as a technology, it's not a tool to use for risk assessment or construction, or it's a tool to be used operationally for all of these things. And once we start to open our minds to using things operational like this, the, the, the savings are just uh, it, you know very huge, very huge. Um, so just kind of taking, you know, what a walkthrough of an acute care facility looks like, this is the experience that you get. You feel like this Google Street View experience, but in a secure space where we're redacting sensitive information to obviously meet our HIPAA compliance, but be able to navigate and to find things, to understand where our sensitive equipment is. We have so much in a hospital and be able to locate and know where things are and how they're stored and, and all the policies and procedures and to be able to get, again to explain these things efficiently through visual tools is really powerful um here's another project uh, uh, is a design project where we're showing a very kind of um, low detail bim where we're implementing the exact make and models of the cameras on what we're showing as a box for the building and, and this is uh you know taking it to the next step with from the design concept so that we can use uh, physical models and, and exact specs on those models to illustrate how we're going to do things from a design and implementation perspective. But it is actually, I think only about 30 hours of modeling into this model, we're able to do something that is far, far less expensive than a traditional scan to BIM, uh, which becomes really uh, cost prohibitive on a smaller project but also you know, heavily used in a major construction project. So we are bringing in the 3D models and the 2D CAD drawings in addition to taking 360 imagery. So we're a little bit agnostic on the visualization and allow customers to be able to bring this information in and use it different ways. I think this image is really kind of telling them what you'd capture from a 360 image as opposed to a model and having the real existing conditions, vegetation, all of these different aspects um, are really valuable in, in the design process and implementation. Uh, and, and to deal with type of surface we're, we're dealing with, is it concrete or brick or wood or all of these types of aspects, right? Um, and then, you know, we can't forget the construction. Now this is not a security construction project, but I think it's a great illustration of showing a progress management. You can see that we have various CAD drawings that we can pull up whatever respective drawing that we're looking at, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, security, fire, and, and have that two-dimensional information and relate it to the real world with the 3D information at different points in time. And then also to be able to do a timeline compare and pull out a report and you know, email something simple to someone, as simple as a PDF, so that they can uh, see and digest this information and communicate back 
or take that information and, 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 and implement something in terms of a finding uh, if there's an issue or something like that that we're addressing. So let's look at a sensor installation. And this sensor uh, is a really cool, unique thing that I know that MT3 or M3T is bringing on in the, in the new year. And it's a, it, it basically is measuring the heart rate and breathing pattern uh, through a radio frequency. And that's so cool because we can do real time uh, monitoring of, uh, of, of, of health conditions, but also occupancy um, monitoring, uh, also looking at uh, how many people we have in the building and where precisely they are. Imagine that from an emergency perspective, what that means to have that type of information and also looking at spatial utilization, these sort of things. Great technology, but the challenge with all of these types of uh, cloud or, or radio or Wi-Fi based technologies is you need to place those sensors accurately to calibrate them and make sure that they work operationally, they, they operate properly. And in this challenge of this uh, six stories of this building, uh, 700 sensors, there was a lot of back and forth because the, the, the design engineers are not out on site and they're taking 2D diagrams that are inaccurate, marking up plans and designs on what to implement. An integrator gets those, gets to the site condition and say, well, I ain't gonna work. So I'll just put it here. And, and again, those types of changes are what happens all the time in construction. And as a result, there's a multiplier effect and things don't always work out. So as a result, there's more site visits uh, going to replace and recalibrate or relocate these, these, uh, these sensors to get them operating uh, properly. So as a result, poor client satisfaction, more downtime, more time and cost back and forth to the site this gets to a place where, where the profitability and the experience is not great. So we work with this customer and we're running our 360 Rover, driving through all the cubicles and locating all these sensors in a very short period of time. We're getting up into the, the, the above uh, ceiling area to be able to locate those sensors as well. So from a de delivery perspective or deliverable uh, perspective, this is what we get. And, and this could have easily been done both in the pre-design and in the installation. In this case, we only have a, a, you know, a handful of photographs, which would have took about five minutes, and now we can accurately know where these uh, gateways are located. And also see this is falling off the walls. So from a quality perspective on the install, we can have that type of oversight. So be able to, to quickly navigate through large spaces, be able to find small assets or, or, or things uh, that we can then commission off with make, model, serial number, can be really valuable from a maintenance perspective and from an ongoing perspective if we have something that's down. Well, well, where is it? How do I find it? And where can I fix it? Now, if you see all these ceiling tiles that are, are lifted out here, I was on the site that I removed 20 ceiling tiles, or sorry, 30 ceiling tiles to find two gateway locations. I can tell you that was not fun. It was a huge waste of time. And I would have much rather walk in there, pop one ceiling tile, know exactly what I'm dealing with and have it the first time. And that can absolutely happen. So, you know, we're, we're working a lot more in uh, the operations, municipalities, oil and gas, a lot of different areas and healthcare being one of those to be able to uh, tag our assets and have all the relevant asset attribute information available at our fingertips. And not only that, but actually bridge the gap between our visual tool and a tool like IBM Maximo from a, a CMMS system. So that you know, I can look at work orders, click and find something. You know, and if I'm doing security, I want to know where something is. I can find it and find the, the fastest path to that location. And all of the operator uh, material, operator manuals, troubleshooting videos, training videos, all of that can be uh, you know at our fingertips. So what we can experience is just like I was. I, I basically I'm going to call the facility manager. I'm going to book an appointment. I'm going to come down and get the keys. I'm going to walk through this site. I'm going to find that asset manually, and then I'm going to be able to look at the nameplate to get make model serial number order a part, for example. So these types of things can now be virtual, and I can do all of that without even being on site and have all of those assets kind of managed here in one place. So, you know, this is a mechanical kind of example. Obviously, we, are, we can do this with security equipment, or with any assets uh, and, and any service providers that might need access to this information as well. Um, one other quick video I wanted to show is, is what we're doing with training materials. So what's in that three ring binder and what can we make more accessible? How do we provide context between this process and that physical asset and where it is in the building? And I think this really lends to emergency management planning 
and, and be able to provide training videos that interactive that take us down the hallway to know where that exit is, to do that scenario-based uh, illustrative or, or immersive learning so that people can take this information and learn it in a visual way or to be able to come back and find this information uh, rather than look through, you know, uh, three ring binders or a folder full of videos and, 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 and documents. So, you know, what does that look like from an asset level? We can tag assets with QR codes and access that information, have all of our asset information, our training videos, all of this information at our fingertips. That's what's possible today. And that, that affects the whole uh, life cycle of a facility and all those that are in it. And there's some major savings to be made here. So on this one case study alone, we're looking at $500 uh, per site visit every time fans are rolling to the site. We're looking at a, you know, a digital capture saving about $9,000 of capturing that facility uh, with 360 imagery instead of LIDAR. And we're looking at a reduction of site visits, but 80%. So look at the operational value from that when we look at the, the types of budgets that these cities or these uh, healthcare organizations are working with today and, and what can be, uh, you know, kind of gained by working with visualization. Um, and I have some closing benefits here, but I want to come back to Stephen and, and to Ben to, to provide a little bit of feedback from yourself on kind of what we just went through there from design to construction to asset management and get a little bit of your thoughts here before we kind of close off on this conversation and maybe get to some Q&A. Well, I, I, you know, just listening, you, know, you talk about those fundamental pieces is how we build from the ground up. So one is, you know, we have to you know, do our best to avoid rushing to make decisions about design and technology. Uh, we have to take a step back. And as Ben has said, and I have said, and you have said, Kelly, we have to agree on a, on a data set and, and a definition. Um, from there, we build forward. <clears throat> Excuse me, this is not singular in nature, it's fluid. and you know, all these different pieces have to come into play. And that's where visualization makes it easier to talk about what the lighting requirements are and talk about what access or egress um, requirements might be. What are the security statistics? What's that, that data set that we can get from IHSS in terms of, you know, reportable data that's from other hospitals and other scenarios that we can use to build up this information? You talked before about a CMMS system to, to better manage the assets and the performance of those assets. That's a real key when it comes to visualization. And I, as you said, an asset can be a boiler or a chiller or an air handler unit. It could be you know, a camera, it could be a VMS system, it could be an RTLS solution. There's different assets that go into the hospital, not to mention all the medical equipment. X-ray so, machines, everything else, right? There's a lot yeah. in the hospital and, and we have to protect and maintain those aspects as part of our overall security uh, and, and business continuity planning, right? Absolutely, 110% correct. Ben, any uh, closing remarks or thoughts from you before we uh, tie this up and get to some questions? Uh, I th certainly. I think the, the main point that I would hope the audience takes from this is how can we touch relevant stakeholders in a means that facilitates communication that's effective? So we get the right input we make sure we address the right questions properly and utilize that information over time. That's really the key. And, and having been involved with projects as a designer, as an end user and, and all the way through, it's the, the biggest issues that come up are lack of effective project management and lack of effective communication with key stakeholders. And the visualization tool is a framework within which we can do that. And we can inject, like you showed, the YouTube video for training. We can inject the, the manuals and the design guides from IAHSS and, the, and within your operation as well. We can bring all of those together in a means that's readily accessible and communicates in a way that can, can address Language or, or have someone like you, Ben, like. be, be the oversight, right? And to be able to virtually visit and provide feedback through a process to make sure that we're doing things based on the standards. And or your eye is going to pick up something that, you know, the regular contractor is not going to even think about, right? So can we catch these things through the process of, of, of implementation as opposed to later 
and where we identify a problem that has to be fixed, right? That's, that's correct. Great. Well, I want to thank everyone uh, for spending the time. We went a little bit over the budgeted time. I think it's because we squeezed Ben in, but I think it really made the conversation a lot more dynamic. And I appreciate your time, Ben and Stephen. Um, if, uh, if there are no immediate questions, I'm going to take questions by email. Um, you can reach out to me, uh, Kelly at visualplan.net or Stephen. Um, we will uh, send out an email to everyone with the recording of this video. And we really look forward to people communicating with us uh, and most particularly uh, with um, N3T, who is one of our valued partners uh, that provides digital twin services for us and has worked a number of projects uh, with us to be able to provide um, the 360 capture and delivery of these visual digital twins so that you know people can do things more efficiently. So again, thank you for your time. and. Uh, I look forward to from some future conversations here. Excellent. Appreciate everybody as well. Good content, gentlemen. Thank you. Oh, I there we go. Thank you.